So today we have three guests from Illinois Extension and Illinois Indiana Sea Grant to talk about stormwater as it relates to weather extremes and some practices you can use to create and maintain a resilient landscape. So our guests are Eliana Brown, stormwater specialist, Lane Kenoki, outreach associate, and Janice Milanovich, pollution prevention assistant. So we're going to get started with a recording um, pre-prepared for today that's going to cover the topics. And then we'll have a live Q&A with Janice and Lane, who are on the call with us live. So with that, I'll turn it over for you all to get started. Thank you, Erin, for that introduction. These are our topics. I'm going to go over them. I'm going to talk about precipitation trends and introduce practices that can help build resilience at your home or business. Then I'll hand it over to Lane, who will do a deeper dive into plant selection. And then Janice will talk about natural lawn care strategies that keep water in mind. I do want to acknowledge our funders and partners, the Illinois EPA and the EPA Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, GLRI. So it's July and where I am in Champaign-Urbana, um, we could use some rain. Why are we talking about rainwater in a drought? Well, according to Illinois state climatologist Trent Ford, winter and spring have undoubtedly gotten wetter over the past 50 to 100 years. And summer has also gotten wetter statewide. It may not seem like it right now, although at a slower rate. But due to hot temperatures, there is summer drought risk. So we can, in summer, we can have it have, we can have a lot of rain or maybe not enough rain. And so um, kind of looking at the rainfall trends here, this, this table just kind of shows that yes, these numbers are going up even in summer. But um, the thing that we're also seeing is uh, more extreme. Uh, so this particular table that Trent has sent me is uh, shows an increase in the extreme rainfall. Now, extreme events are those that are uh, two inches or more of total precipitation, which occur in a 24 hour period. So we're getting more of those. But we're also having some extreme drought at the same time. Now, if we look into the future, this is also a, another uh, slide that Trent was good enough to provide me. This figure shows the projected change across the Midwest. Now, the changes are shown as uh, relative to the 1990 to 2019 average, and these would be the 2070 to 2099 average. So in 50 years, summers may be drier, uh, but now they, um, they aren't except due to extreme heat, as I've mentioned. The bottom line is, is that in times of drought, it really underlines the value of water. Our conventional stormwater infrastructure treats water as a waste, something to get rid of. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about green infrastructure that treats water as a resource. The answer to both situations can be that green infrastructure or nature-based solutions help us, they help build resilience to both deluge and drought. The good news is that we can make landscape improvements at our homes that are achievable and beautiful. So what is green infrastructure? The National Green Infrastructure Certification Program defines green infrastructure as an approach to stormwater management that protects, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. And here are some of the types you may have heard or seen some of these in your own community. Uh, rainwater harvesting includes rain barrels and cisterns, a lot of people now are familiar with rain gardens. Permeable pavement is really great. You may see that in, uh, in parking lots. Some people have put them in driveways. 
Green roofs tend to be on commercial buildings, though you'll see here in a second that it can also, it can be on a residential application. And then tree trenches are along a lot of our uh, city municipal streets. So here is where I want to plug a video series. We're gonna be getting into talking about resources here and other places that you can see and learn a little bit more. This is a video series that I did a few years ago. It features uh, homeowner applications of green infrastructure using rainwater where it falls. And there are several episodes. You, you can access it from this uh, web address, goillinois.edu slash stormwaterhome. And um, there, uh, there, are all, there are six videos in total, and um, they are primarily um, geared towards uh, homeowners. But um, this last one, simple actions you can do, is something that everybody can do to improve uh, the, the quality and quantity of stormwater management. So here, you know, this is our, our rain barrel. It's a rain garden. We go over some maintenance that a rain garden needs. Uh, this is actually a permeable pavement at a residence. And, and this is a green roof at a, a residence, which is um, a pretty, uh, pretty amazing project that we had the, um, the opportunity to visit with the homeowner to talk about. So I encourage you to check those out. We'll talk a little bit more here today about rain gardens. Just want to highlight rain gardens in this series because this this is one of a, a rain barrel is maybe the the easiest thing that a homeowner can do just a lot of them are now available uh, already built you hook it up and um so that can be a pretty easy thing to do a rain garden is probably the next in the level of something that would be easier and so i just wanted to find here you can see that you would have the storm water that's coming into the rain garden. And the idea is that it soaks into the ground right where it is. So this is this little bowl shape here. And uh, I'm gonna just put a uh, um, little bit, there's our definitions. It's cultivated landscape. Here's that shallow basin capturing the stormwater and snow melt. It does help mitigate flooding and improve water quality. And because you have some plants, and Lane will get into this, they, that are native plants generally. You can support pollinators and greenery helps uh, with human well being. Here are uh, some resources on this uh, Illinois Indiana Sea Grant publication of the Southern Lake Michigan Rain Garden Manual. Uh, and then uh, we're going to give you a, a few other resources as we go further in this. Do you want to say that um, Extension has a has imported this Purdue Rainscaping course. There's the uh, website if you want to learn a little bit more about that. So we are at, at Illinois, we are, um, our extension offices, many of our extension offices are starting to host this course. It is 15 hours of training module uh, in a workshop setting. The um, target audience for this course are master gardeners, master naturalists, and others with a, a baseline knowledge of gardening. And it takes you a little bit further into the things that you need to learn to build a rain garden. And then um, the course culminates with a, a demonstration rain garden build. So I encourage you to uh, look for that in your, uh, your local extension office. Another resource I'm gonna share with you here um, about rain gardens is a project that um, Lane and I work on, the Red Oak Rain Garden, actually the director of the Red Oak Rain Garden. And this is a large demonstration garden on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana. You um, can visit our website and learn a lot about uh, rain gardens and about what we, how we, um, what it took to build this rain garden and what uh, what it takes to maintain it. And we talk a lot about plants. You can also follow us on all the various platforms and um, 
Last thing there, you can also sign up for our newsletter if you wanna get all the news about the Red Oak Rain Garden. Uh, if you are interested in rain gardens, I highly, highly recommend, <laughs> highly recommend this project that we work on, uh, but we do, we do provide a lot of great rain garden information and uh, plant information. Um, some of the, the lessons that we have learned from working on the Red Oak Rain Garden get integrated into these brochures that are uh, available on the Red Oak Rain Garden website. They are also on the Illinois Indiana, well, the, the, they, they are officially housed on the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant website. Uh, and this, these, uh, these brochures are really wonderful on kind of walking you through some thing, things to do and um, showing you what uh, what plants, what the plant attributes are. Lane is going to go a little bit further into this, so I will let him do that, but wanted to uh, share with you the variety of, uh, of brochures that we have and recommend that you check these out too. And that is the perfect segue to hand it over to Lane. All right, perfect. Thanks, Eliana. So now that we have uh, a little bit more of an in-depth understanding of the historical patterns of, of rainfall and, and the future trends as, as our climate changes, um, it's time to start looking at some of the tools that we have available to us to adapt to these changing conditions. And one of those tools is the use of native plants. Uh, so before we really dive into the details of all of this, I think it's, under, uh, it's important to get a little bit more of an understanding of why native plants fit into this equation, why they're important, um, why average homeowners should be looking at these, um, these kinds of practices. So we'll start off first by uh, talking about their uh, their drought tolerance and why they have that drought tolerance. So uh, when you look at the Illinois native prairies, uh, some species out there have roots that extend 15 feet into the soil. And those really deep roots are pulling up moisture from deep, deep into, into the ground. Um, and, and the ability to pull up that moisture is allowing for these plants to gain uh, varying levels of drought resistance some some of which especially those ones with roots that go down you know five plus feet into the soil those are really going to have great drought tolerance uh, historically uh, those deep roots would also allow uh, for plants to survive uh, uh, prairie fires which were uh, very common um, prior to european settlement and even today in restoration prairies and the few um, the few uh, prairies that we have remaining um, that have never been plowed, those deep roots also help um, help the plant in that way. Uh, of course, we don't have to worry so much about uh, fire these days, but drought uh, is is one that uh, just about everyone should be familiar with. Um, these plants are also helping to build and maintain soil health. The plants promote clean water. And, uh, and water conservation by reducing the need for garden inputs. You're not having to use as many uh, pesticides or, um, or uh, herbicides, things like that on these, uh, these gardens that may be planted with, with native plants. They also require less fertilizer, less pesticides, as I mentioned, when planted in conditions that are similar to their natural ecosystems. So plants that need to be, uh, you know, in uh, poor soil, which we have a lot of them. Uh, there are species that uh, don't want the soil to be too fertile. Um, and we'll talk about a few of those later, uh, later in the webinar. But, um, but by using those species, we're decreasing our needs on some of those, some of those inputs. Uh, right plant, right place is a phrase that we master gardeners uh, use a lot. And, and that is certainly the case. And a lot of these native plants are also food sources. I'm sure that a lot of us are familiar with, with pollinators like our bees or butterflies, hummingbirds, just to name a few. So uh, just to touch on a couple of 
of points of why native plants are important in this conversation um, about rainfall management, uh, you know, tying into uh, the extremes that we are, uh, we have experienced, we are experiencing, and will continue to experience into the future when it comes to both drought and flood. So we're going to really dive into some of the details now. Um, we're going to focus a lot on drought today, since we are kind of in those conditions, but we will also be providing plenty of resources um, for you to connect you with some of our flood uh, sort of resources as well. So Eliana already mentioned the resource brochures that have been developed based off of the uh, Red Oak Grain Garden. Um, and again, we will put these links in the chat box uh, and these will be provided to those watching the, the webinar. But we'll start off just with, with this first one. This will just sort of be an example. All of the brochures in this series follow a same format. So in this case, this is a full sun pollinator garden. Inside of it, you will find a planting plan, uh, the number of plants that you need for this specific garden. You'll find some four season interest uh, there at the at the top right. Uh, you know, we want these gardens to be beautiful in the spring, summer, fall and winter. So we've taken that into account while developing these brochures for you. Uh, and then, of course, you have the list of species, uh, the seasonality, uh, you know, when those species might be in bloom and what they look like. And then down here in the in the bottom right corner, we have basically all of the attributes that you need for uh, for the implementation of these native plants. You've got your sunlight conditions, your height, your spacing, the moisture requirements for those species, which of course is important for this um, this webinar in particular. We've also got our soil types. Uh, the ecosystems in which they existed previously, and then some of the attractions that, uh, that those species um, will bring, such as bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, and birds. I'll also uh, point out that in the, uh, in the brochure series, we include levels of drought tolerance. So in this highlighted green circled area, the solid green check marks indicate that that plant is solidly drought tolerant. Uh, you do not need to irrigate for those. You uh, um, should have no problems with these species surviving drought after they establish. Typically, that, uh, that establish, uh, establishment period is going to be at least a year after you have planted that plant. Um, you know, the, the plants need to put down roots before they are going to be drought tolerant. Uh, in this case, the, uh, the species that have the green uh, check mark, but it is not filled in, that indicates that the plant has some levels of drought tolerance, but may, uh, may yellow or wilt in times of drought, but it will survive. On the back page, you will find an explanation of what the sun pollinator garden is, some additional planting options, where you may want to locate those plants within a rain garden. In this case, there aren't any plants that, uh, that would prefer to be in the wet basin of a rain garden. For the most part, these are plants that are gonna be located on these slopes and on the drier banks of the rain garden as shown in, in this image. We also connect you to, uh, to where to find the plants and for more information. And then a connection to uh, a wonderful map that displays some of the native gardens across the state. So let's talk about some of the plants. Uh, if you haven't uh, noticed yet, I'm a bit of a plant nerd. Um, so I'm excited to talk about some of these today. We'll first start off with native plants for dry sun. So these are going to be your species that are very drought tolerant, um, ones that can really withstand those dry, dry conditions like we here in Champaign-Urbana are currently experiencing and really have been, uh, you know, here we are on uh, July 14th. We have been experiencing uh, moderate drought now for two full weeks. Um, in fact, it may even be three weeks uh, at, at this point. So uh, these are species that are still doing pretty well right now. Um, 
Eliana mentioned rain gardens. So I am going to mention right at the beginning of this section that these are plants that are going to be best suited for your dry banks. If you think back to that last uh, graphic of the rain garden that was shown on the back page of the brochure, this is that high point of the rain garden. This is not in the basin of the bowl. This is right at the right at the tip, the rim of the of the rain garden. So many of those, again, are going to have your extensive root systems providing drought, uh, drought resistance. And there's really a wonderful variety of, of grasses and wildflowers for, for these conditions. Um, some of the iconic native Illinois plants are, are uh, in, this, in this dry sun kind of category. So we have species like pale purple coneflower, great seasonal plant with blooms uh, late spring into early summer. Uh, we're on the downside, the downswing of those blooms now, but they, uh, they do for the most part remain standing. Um, they are attractive to songbirds. Uh, the birds like the seeds from this species. We've got, uh, of course, the butterfly weed, um, which, I mean, you just, you don't find uh, orange blooming plants very often. So I like to use these when I'm looking for a unique color in my gardens. It's also just kind of all around a great plant to have. Um, summertime bloomer, a uh, host plant for the monarch butterfly. Um, and it's really, it's a, it's a beautiful plant, wonderful drought resistance as well. Gray-headed coneflower is another uh, one of those really bright pops of color. Uh, this one will bloom throughout summer. Uh, I've even had this blooming into September uh, in, in my personal gardens as well as at the Red Oak Rain Garden, uh, which a lot of these photos that you'll see today are from the Red Oak Rain Garden. Um, and some of them have been taken as recently as, uh, as last week. So uh, some of these photos are solidly within this drought period that we're talking about. Gray-headed coneflower can get a little on the aggressive side, so uh, you may want to uh, to consider that when you're planning out your your garden. Purple coneflower, you know, this is one of those iconic rain garden plants. It works really well on the banks. It does have quite a bit of drought um, drought tolerance, but uh, this is also a species that can work, uh, you know, in some of the wetter areas as well, uh, and that's important. And we will talk about that uh, here in a bit. Purple poppy mallow, uh, wonderful ground cover plant. Really, really beautiful blooms late spring uh, through midsummer. It's one that I would really recommend for, for just about anyone to use uh, if they need a ground cover for a drier location. Royal catchfly is actually an Illinois endangered species. This is one that, uh, that I have really come to uh, enjoy growing at the, the Red Oak Rain Garden. That bright red um, is a beautiful pop of, of color in the summertime. And then, of course, we've got our grasses like little blue stem which is um, actually, I believe it's the 2022 um, perennial plant of the year. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, special, a special grass. It works well in just about any home garden that, uh, that gets those dry sun conditions. Prairie drop seed is another fairly low growing grass that, uh, that works well in, in the dry sun uh, garden. And there's tons of others. I can't go into to detail on all of them, but if you'd like, you can take a screenshot of this. It does not include the species that I have mentioned earlier in this presentation, but just to give you an idea of the wide variety of forbs, shrubs, and grasses that, that we have native to Illinois that, uh, that really work well for these drought conditions, um, these, are, these are good ones for you. We'll dive into native plants for dry shade now. So uh, still dealing with the dry side of things, but this time we're gonna talk about plants in the shade. So again, these are gonna be suited best for your rain garden banks when you're considering um, you know, where these may be located on a rain garden. They're adapted to those shady conditions where forest trees tend to soak up a lot of available water. Um, just as with the dry sun plants, there's a nice variety. Uh, in this case, we have a lot of spring ephemerals, sedges, and ferns for these dry shade conditions. 
bloodroot is one of the first plants to bloom in the spring. Uh, it's really just a beautiful flower. Um, good foliage too. Uh, for uh, for the first half of summer, those leaves will die back uh, in the summertime. They will come back um, the next spring. This is what is called a spring ephemeral. Um, we do have a resource uh, on spring ephemerals as well. So if you're interested, uh, definitely check that out. Uh, wild columbine is one that I think a lot of people are familiar with. There's a lot of great cultivars of this plant as well. This is the straight species, wild columbine. Nice red flower, good for dry shade conditions. Woodland phlox is one of my favorites. Um, you can't really go wrong with this plant in those dry shady conditions. This is also one of those plants that is a little bit more tolerant of, you know, basically anything from moist soil to dry soil. Um, so a really good one for, for those varieties of conditions, but in this case, we're talking about it for dry shade. False Solomon Seal is another uh, really interesting plant. This one's got uh, some nice uh, textured leaves. It grows to, you know, three, maybe four feet tall at max. Nice flowers on it as well, uh, but really it's the texture of those leaves that I think makes this plant interesting for those dry shade conditions. Wild ginger is sort of the opposite. It is very low. Uh, wonderful, wonderful ground cover species. This one rarely gets eight inches tall, um, but really forms a nice dense mat of, of, um, of these green leaves, sort of heart-shaped leaves. They also have really interesting uh, red flowers in, in the springtime. It's one of my favorite plants for those dry, shady conditions. Prairie alum root. Uh, this is a hookra, actually, one of our native hookras. Um, this one can tolerate full sun, but also uh, does quite well in those dry shade conditions. We've got it um, pictured here at the Red Oak Rain Garden. Talking about some of those more grassy textured species, this is Pennsylvania sedge, not a grass, but a sedge. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge does really well in, in those dry shade conditions, keeps that nice dark green foliage for most of the year. We've got Christmas fern, which is a lovely fern species native to Illinois. Uh, this one is also uh, adaptable. It, it will grow uh, in more moist conditions as well, but, uh, but can do quite nicely in, um, in dry shade conditions. And just as with the Sun-loving drought-tolerant species, there's a whole list of other ones that I just can't, don't have the time to, to go over, um, but here is, uh, here's a nice list uh, that you may want to take a screenshot of. Um, and again, it doesn't include the species that I've been talking about today, but these are some of the ones that I wish I could talk about, but just don't have the time to do so. So it's really important to plan for both of those water extremes, both drought and, and deluge. Uh, so here in this photo, again, this, this is the Red Oak Rain Garden with standing water in it. Um, this was taken uh, last year. I would love to see some standing water in the rain garden again, but I don't know when we're going to see that again. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully sometime this year. So when you're designing your landscape features like rain gardens or bioswales, some of the plants in the basin have to be able to handle that standing water like you saw in that last, um, in that last photo, at least for a short period of time. You know, ideally, your, your water is going to be draining within 24 hours. Uh, you don't want to attract mosquitoes um, and things like that. But uh, those plants really need to be able to, um, to withstand, they need to withstand uh, short periods at least of inundation. However, we have extreme conditions like we're dealing with right now, where we have dry spells. Uh, you know, like I like I said, we're in a moderate drought right now. We have not had standing water in the garden um, since late winter. Uh, so, so those plants, even at the bottom of your rain garden, need to be able to withstand uh, some dry spells. And lucky for us, there are some plants that perform really well in those tough conditions. And uh, a couple that I'm going to talk about have been tested and, uh, and have done really well at Urbana's Red Oak Rain Garden. The first of which is Southern Blue Flag Iris. This is one that does well in those, uh, those basin conditions, those wet, wet conditions. Uh, Common Rush is another. And Emery's Sedge. And that combination of three plants, we've actually had really wonderful success with at the, at the Red Oak Rain Garden. And here's the cool thing. 
Those three plants did really well in the in the full sun. They also did really well in the in the at least part shade. Um, you know, we had blooms on our on on our irises in both of those conditions, and in fact, this emery sedge may have actually done even a little bit better in the shaded conditions. Uh, in the sun, it gets to be a little bit on the aggressive side. Uh, these three species just do a fantastic job in our basins, both sun and shade, and you know they they have withstood inundation of uh, of water multiple times. You know, in one month, and now we have, we have also experienced them. Uh, performing just as well with um, with months of of dry weather. Here's a list of some other species tolerant of both of those water extremes. These are not necessarily ones that we have had experience with, but these are uh, these are species that others within the professional field um, agree have have tolerance of a flood and drought. I also want to talk briefly on the subject of stormwater benefits of trees. It's a really important piece of this of this puzzle as well. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into the detail of these, but I want to at least touch on a couple of those benefits. So they soak up a lot of water, and uh, and that really helps to control the volume. Uh, of our stormwater runoff. They also help to increase soil infiltration, which allows our soils to retain more moisture as those tree roots are, are expanding throughout the soil. They're opening those pores. They're allowing more and more water to, uh, to be held in those soils. Trees also help to reduce nutrient loads into our local waterways, thus improving our local water quality. Uh, two of the, the nutrients that trees need the most of are nitrogen and phosphorus, both of which can be found in excess, especially in our urban stormwater runoff. Uh, and our trees do a great job of capturing those nutrients and using them. There are other benefits as well, um, but we're not going to get into too many of those. Um, so I will direct you to a really great resource from the USDA Forest Service, and I will put that link in the chat. Also, just to give you a few more resources on uh, flood tolerant plants in general, um, I know we, we focused pretty heavily on drought conditions today, but Eliana and I have given multiple webinars and presentations in the past on uh, the subject of flood tolerant plants, uh, especially as they relate to rain gardens. So uh, there are a few webinars listed here, as well as an extension web page that is uh, a good resource. It's also a good idea to check out plant finder tools or databases that you can find online um, from native plant nurseries or just plant nurseries in general. And, and those can be really great resources when you're looking for plants for you know, wet conditions, dry conditions, uh, and even just as simple as finding plants that, that will grow well in sun or shade conditions as well. Um, I would highly recommend checking out uh, some of those online nurseries with those databases. The EPA, the NRCS, both also have nice resources that can help you find these flood tolerant plants. Um, you know, even the uh, USDA Forest Service, like I was just talking about in the previous slide, uh, a lot of those agencies have, have good resources that, uh, that you can check out for these topics. So just to give you an idea of the Red Oak Rain Garden and these current drought conditions that we're facing, uh, this is the Red Oak Rain Garden. Um, as you can see sort of on the, the edges of these photos, that is some really dry grass. Our grass here in Champaign has been dormant now for a while. Um, we just have not had enough rain to, to keep it green. But in the basin of the Red Oak Rain Garden, uh, these, are, these are wet loving species that are also tolerant of those dry conditions. The, the grassy texture that you see here is predominantly uh, that emery sedge. Here in the background, you also can see some of the uh, southern blue flag iris and the common rush. Um, and we really have those mixed in throughout. This is not one solid block of emery sedge, uh, but with, with groupings of, of rushes and irises throughout here. You don't see the irises in bloom here because they finished their bloom season. Um, in early June. To give you an even better idea, this is the same space as seen from above. Look at how how brown the uh, the grass is around the garden. There's there's just not much um, 
that's not dormant besides, you know, the, the weeds that you see um, that have uh, that have survived the drought, unfortunately. But I think this photo does a great job of showing just how green the center of this rain garden is compared to uh, to the drought zones or the, the dry zones that are outside of the garden. And with that, you know, I think that might be a, the perfect segue to toss it over to Janice to talk about, uh, you know, those lawn conditions, because not everybody is going to have, you know, a rain garden across their entire lawn. Um, so maybe we should talk about some of the, uh, the practices that homeowners can take or make in their, in their own landscapes to address these conditions. Janice? Thank you, Lane. You're right. Many of our lawns look like this right now. This is my lawn on July 1st. And as Lane alluded to, we're gonna talk a bit about dormancy. So it's important to note that the browning turf seen here is a natural adaptation of turf grass to survive in the stress caused by heat. So in the summer, if you choose not to water your grass, it may turn brown, but it doesn't necessarily mean your grass is dead. It's going dormant. Most of our lawns in the Midwest are made of cool season grasses, meaning they thrive in cool, humid climates, and most of their growth is then in the spring and the fall. Summer is a period of reduced growth, and this browning is the plant survival mode. In a few moments, I'll talk more about how to manage your lawn during drought. But first, I wanted to say that Illinois Indiana Sea Grant's Lawn to Lake program is a big supporter of finding the right plant for the right place. Grass isn't the best choice for some conditions like deep shade, heavily traveled paths, or areas with drainage issues. And there's some great alternatives, including the beautiful natives just discussed. But we also recognize that turf grass is part of our human managed environment. We each may have only a relatively small lawn, but when you add it up, it accounts for a significant amount of land. About 40 million acres of turf grass grows in the United States. And for some perspective, Illinois covers roughly 37 million acres. The good news is there's growing interest in natural or more sustainable lawn care. The Lawn to Lake program hopes to meet that need by informing homeowners and communities how the actions we take on land can affect waterways nearby and downstream. Lawns provide a place for us and our pets to play and relax and perhaps most importantly, it provides ground cover, preventing soil erosion. With this benefit in mind, we offer some resources to encourage the adoption of sustainable lawn practices that we call natural lawn care. But what exactly is natural lawn care? What's well, a set of recommended practices that work in line with nature and not against it? It considers your lawn as part of an ecosystem or a community of the living, things interacting with the non-living things like soil, water, and air. So it makes sense that soil health is the foundation. The approach then relies on practices that foster healthy turf. And when intervention is needed, the problem is correctly identified and appropriate control methods are taken before resorting to other interventions, effectively treating the problem at its source instead of just the symptoms. I imagine the adoption of natural lawn care transforms the caretaker into an ecologist of sorts. One might perceive this as a more complicated process than conventional lawn care that traditionally relies on a one size fits all approach and makes use of readily available synthetic products, sometimes treats the symptoms for short term fixes. But with natural lawn care, you'll be paying attention to a different set of details, which leads me to a quick personal story. I snagged this picture of my dog last summer, but looking past that adorable pup, you can see the state of my backyard. Stress from the heat, soil compaction from my kids playing, and my dog's urine left a patchy weedy lawn. So using the Lawn to Lake principles, I completed some lawn renovations last year. Mid-August, I top-dressed the lawn with compost, I hired someone to core aerate, and then I reseeded. I used a slow-release fertilizer early in the fall. I also mulched my leaves into the lawn instead of raking them up. This year, I've been maintaining a higher blade height on my mower. It's not perfect, but I'm pleased with the results and how much more resilient my lawn seems to be, especially with the heat we've had this summer. 
And I know it's not all about aesthetics too. As I mentioned before, a dense stand of turf slows the flow of water. So when it does rain, it will allow the water and nutrients to infiltrate the soil. Now, I know this is a very unscientific example, but it's based on the lawn care practices that have been well studied and evaluated. So let's dig into those. Today, we'll have time to cover an overview of the basics listed here. Together, these practices manage for favorable growing conditions that allow turf grass to resist weeds, pest, disease, and drought. Now, you may have heard the recommendations. Don't mow if it doesn't grow, so it's not growing in the summer. Don't need to mow it. Don't put the stress on the lawn. And don't mow if it's too wet, if it's heavy and soggy. You don't want your lawnmower running over that space. But when it is time to mow, our number one recommendation, and by far the easiest thing you can do, is to mow high. You can easily raise the blade on your mower, so you're mowing at a height of three to four inches tall for cool season grasses. The upper range is recommended for the summer. Now this one action is gonna do a lot of really great things. The taller grass shades out weeds and perhaps most importantly, promotes deep, healthy roots. You'll see in this illustration that there is a correlation between the length of the leaf blade and the root mass. Longer grass promotes a larger root system, which in turn is more drought tolerant. Also, a longer blade provides more leaf surface to capture light and make more food for a healthy plant. You'll also want to maintain a sharp mower blade. Dull blades shred and tear the grass, which can make the plant more susceptible to disease, it also takes it longer to heal. So cleanly cut glass, grass blades also conserve more water, which is important in the summer. And finally, a sharp blade requires less energy for your mower. Now I do want to mention there's one last consideration about mowing, and that is the one third rule, which is not removing more than one third of the leaf blade at a time. And I'll focus on that for our next slide. When I maintain my can mostly Kentucky bluegrass lawn at about three inches, I can let my lawn grow to about four and a half inches in height. It allows me a little bit longer between cuts in comparison to maintaining a lawn at two inches, which may require even more frequent cuts not to violate that one third rule. Even better yet, allowing your lawn to grow to six inches and mowing at four could potentially give you even more than a week between cuts. And that's assuming one and a half inches of growth per week. But above all, I want to note that mowing is stressful for your plant. You're removing living tissue. So that leads to water loss and energy spent healing. Now, there's another good reason for this one third rule. And that is our next tip to leave the clippings. By only cutting a small portion of the grass blade, it'll allow those clippings to filter down into the soil and decompose, adding nutrients and organic material to your soil. This practice is a free way to improve your soil health. Mow high and leave it hot, leave it lie is our mantra. It's also good to know that the common misconception that grass clippings contribute to thatch is not true. Actually, the decomposition of grass clippings encourages beneficial microbes that break down thatch. And these decomposed clippings are equivalent to one fertilizer application for your lawn each year. Do you have to note what's most important for water quality is that you wanna make sure you don't leave your glass clippings on hard surfaces like your sidewalks or driveways and never blow them into the street. Sweep them back up into your lawn where they can feed your grass. The next step is water efficiently. We've discussed dormancy as a natural adaptation of turf to handle heat and stress in an effort to conserve water and nutrients. And during an extended drought, more than three to four weeks long, it may be necessary to apply about one fourth to one half inch of water every two to four weeks. It won't green up your lawn, but it'll provide enough water to keep the plants alive until cooler temps and rain becomes more consistent. If you do choose to add supplemental water during the summer to keep your grass actively growing, your lawn will need about one inch of water each week. That includes rainfall. 
So that's where a rain gauge or a tuna can or really anything with straight sides can help you to measure that rainfall and the amount of water you've added. How you water is also important. We encourage watering deeply and infrequently to encourage deeper roots. As pictured here, deeper roots have greater access to water. But know that applying too much water is a waste because it'll just move past the root zone. Finally, watering in the morning is recommended for disease prevention. But above all, avoid watering those hard surfaces to conserve water. Now we briefly mentioned that soil care is the foundation of a healthy lawn, and it's important to test your soil so you have the best environment for your turf grass. It's recommended that you test every three to five years, and the Illinois Extension has some really great videos about the ins and outs of soil testing. They can be found by digging into our soil testing section at lawntolakemidwest.org, and I'll put the link in the chat. There you all can also find a map to locate soil testing labs. Now we know as humans, we get regular checkups and the same is true for our soils. So we can get to the root of the problem before any deficiencies impact our lawn. Now thinking about deficiencies, turf grass does have a much higher nutrient requirement than the native plants Lane has discussed. We recommend fall fertilization for cool season grasses. It's an optimum time to provide nutrients it provides root development, enhances your lawn's energy reserves, and extends color retention. A variety of factors will also impact your fertilization program. Your soil test results, your desired lawn quality, your grass species, the age of your lawn, and the desired level of maintenance. Knowing that a higher fertilization schedule will promote more growth, equating to some more maintenance, irrigation, and increased disease monitoring. As with those grass clippings, always make sure that you sweep up any excess fertilizer that falls on off of those hard surfaces and back onto your lawn. Once again, lawntolakemidwest.org has some more in-depth information about the timing and types of nutrient sources. So I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat as well. Along the lines of improving those soil conditions is our next three for one basic tip to aerate, overseed, and top dress. Together, these practices build healthy soil. Core aeration moves, removes cores of soil. This process allows water, oxygen, and nutrients to move through the soil. It reduces compaction, can manage for thatch, and improves microbial activity. It's generally recommended to aerate in the fall. And the practice can improve poorly draining areas that you may have noticed during heavy rain or periods of rain. Overseeding in the fall, like late August, early September, will increase the density of your lawn. And finally, top dressing with a thin layer of compost or mulch leaves can increase the soil organic matter. Now, this organic matter is so important because it acts like a sponge. It gives the roots more time to soak up water and nutrients which can prevent flooding, erosion, and nutrient runoff. I did wanna note that organic matter is measured and reported in your soil testing results. So our last tip is to use fewer lawn chemicals like pesticides, herbicides, and insecticides, and fungicides. Whew. All these chemicals can control your unwanted weeds, insects, or plant diseases but they do pose a danger to people, pets, and our water, and ultimately our environment. So first you'll need to determine your action threshold. Now that's the amount of damage you're willing to allow before an intervention is needed. When the plant or pest exceed that threshold, it's time to apply a control method. Like the mechanical dandelion puller pictured here. We recommend four steps towards using less chemicals which are part of the Integrated Pest Management Plan, or IPM, which I'll use for short. IPM is an approach that focuses on prevention, like the practices we've discussed to create a healthy lawn, then early detection by monitoring before the problem gets out of hand. This is where proper identification of the pest is key, so you can learn about its life cycle and then use some control measures to disrupt that life cycle. I'll discuss some more control measures in just a moment. 
with our IPM pyramid, but I wanted to note that there are no quick fixes. So continuing to evaluate and record what worked and what didn't is important. So here's the IPM pyramid. I mentioned just a minute ago, and we'll work our way up from the bottom, moving from prevention towards any interventions that you need to make. So the first is our cultural controls in blue at the base, many of which we've already talked about, right? Your healthy soil, mowing high, carefully fertilizing, watering properly. You're essentially setting yourself up for success by providing the conditions for a healthy and resilient lawn. Next, we have our mechanical or physical controls in gray. I alluded to these before, such as a hand weeding, making sure you have your sharp mower blades and spring cleanups. They're all really hands-on ways to control for pests and potential problems. Biological controls are in yellow. These are controls using naturally occurring predators, parasites, and pathogens to manage for pests. You'd have to do some more investigation work here, and it might be helpful to contact your local county extension office as a resource. Finally, at the top in red are chemical controls. These should be used only when all the other control measures have not helped you reach your goal. Your focus should be on the least toxic product available, spot treating if possible. Again, your local extension staff could be a helpful resource to determine the most effective chemical. The whole idea behind IPM, which I really love, is taking a step back, investigating the issue at hand, how did it become a problem, and what ways can you prevent it so less intervention is needed. That wraps up our basic tips, but I did want to share a few of our Lawn to Lake resources that are again available at lawndelakemidwest.org. Um, but we will also share a link to them in the chat and in a follow-up email because three of these newer brochures are cover some of the topics we talked about today, soil testing and IPM. And then we have another one that talks about choosing the best turf grass suited to your landscape. Most county extension offices have print copies. And of course, I have to make one less plug for our new website. I'm enthusiastic about it because it really is full of such great information from monthly lawn tips. We've got the basics we've talked about and a place to dig into the weeds for more information about each of the basic steps. It really has a great selection of some internal and external resources as well. And finally, I'd love to highlight some of the special features on the web page. We have a natural lawn care quiz, so you can check off boxes for the lawn care practices you're currently doing. And then it will share if you're a natural lawn care master or a beginner, and it'll give you some places to explore so you could improve your score. As I mentioned before, we've got some resources for soil testing and some about fertilizing appropriately, including a nifty calculator to help with the math. Finally, I just wanted to say that we know these weather extremes are gonna impact our landscapes. And as we mentioned, they may become more frequent going forward. We hope we've provided you all with some tools, strategies, and planting ideas that we believe work together to build a more resilient lawn and landscape. Next, we'd love to hear from you. What questions do y'all have?